if you choose to. Proverbs 22 and verse 7. I've entitled today's message, Act Your Wage. Act Your Wage. Ever, anybody ever heard the phrase, act your age? How many parents have told your kid, man, I wish you would just act your age? How old are you? Right? Especially the boys. How old are you? Act your wage. For many of us, we need the message, we need the words in our heart to act our wage. Hopefully you've had a chance to turn to Proverbs 22 and verse 7. And it says, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is a servant to the lender. And we talked about that word servant really being meaning bound, is bound, bondaged to the lender. Last week we turned about we talked about being strapped and, and being bound by debt. Do you remember this statement? I'm in bondage. I'd like to do whatever, but I can't afford it. Remember we talked about that. Remember we talked about shaking off the guilt of making dumb choices with money. We've all done it. We've all done the order something we shouldn't have, an impulse bought. Do you know that every one of the checkout counters at the grocery store, right? You, you take your buggy, you've got all your groceries, you fill it up, you get down to the checkout counter, and what is it all filled with right at the beginning before you get to the cashier? Candy, magazines, right? Gum, soda pop. And is it the big case of soda pop that's back in the aisle? No, it's the one individual bottle that is twice the price as if you'd have bought the case in the back. It's all impulse buy items. Why? Because they want you to spend more money. We've all done it. Last week, we made two, these two statements. Number one, we don't... You remember? We don't serve money. We serve God. That's pretty quiet. Let's try that again. We don't. We serve. There we go. Thank you. Makes me happy to hear you talk back. One more phrase that I want us to look at that we talked about last week. So I think you'll know what to do with this one. We won't have to go back and do it a second time. Money serves us as we serve God. Good, thank you. Some of you didn't remember. You're like, uh, I don't remember what that one said. That's okay. See, not, not too long ago, there used to be a standard rule of thumb. Something that everybody lived by for thousands of years, if you didn't have money to buy the thing that you wanted, anybody want to guess what happened? You didn't buy it. You couldn't buy it. Whatever it was that you wanted to purchase, you had to wait. You had to save up for it. You had to defer gratification. That's a big term. Deferred gratification is something our modern society does not do anymore. We instant gratify ourselves with all kinds of things. If I want a candy bar, I go to the grocery store or I go to the, the convenience store and I buy a candy bar and I eat it and it's done. And I'm out $2.50. If I want to go have entertainment, I can go to the movies. And I bet, it's 11.13, I bet I could catch a movie in the next 15 minutes. And I could have entertainment for the next two hours. I am immediately satisfied. But there was a time where you only went to the movies at night. Six o'clock, five o'clock matinee was the cheap one. All of us have fallen in at some time to this idea of instant gratification. 
give you another example. Before the Great Depression, only 2% of homes had a mortgage against it. 2%. 98%, their house was paid off. They didn't owe anything against it. Some just 40 years later, only 2% don't have a mortgage against it. 98% of the houses that you see have a loan against them at some percentage rate. Some good, some not so good. There's been a shift from the savers that our parents were to an entitled mindset, this instant gratification. In other words, I'm not saving my pennies. I'm not recycling tin foil. I'm not recycling bacon fat. I want it and I want it now. I'll just spend and spend you did. Now, for some of us, we were part of that next generation. The, 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 the greatest generation, which was our, our grandparents, at least for me, uh, those that, that were out of the, the World War II, Great Depression era. Then you have the baby boomers. Uh, well, you have the silent generation. Then you have the baby boomers. And they were all savers. And then kind of in the middle of the baby boomers and then into the Gen X folks, there was this shift of this mindset to this instant gratification. Things began to come immediate, and we wanted the same thing. And now, guess what? We're all getting up near retirement age or getting up where we're starting to think about maybe I need to have a little bit of money put away. And guess what? We spent in our 20s and our 30s, and there's nothing in our retirement account. Or there's not near what should be there in our retirement account. And while those who continued to save are saying, hey, I'm getting ready to retire. I'm getting ready to take a break from all of this work. The rest of us are saying, dear Jesus, please let me work until you take me home because I don't know what I'm going to do if I don't. Do you know that most preachers, and this is a true thing, most preachers hope to meet Jesus in the pulpit because most preachers don't have enough retirement or have zero retirement and so they have to continue to preach until the Lord takes them uh, I, I served under a pastor who did that um, he retired and then had to he called it retreading and he ended up Preaching until the Lord took him home. See, all of us wish we had th those funds like our parents did. We end up wanting what they had. We talked about this last week, about buying the house, buying the car. What we don't see is the years of scraping and, and saving and, and, and penny-pinching that they did. And we want it. We have ended up being a generation, at least here in the U.S., a generation of pretenders. We have the stuff that our parents have, but unlike our parents, we have the debt that goes along with it, so we don't really owe, own the stuff. We are bound, we're strapped by the debt of the things that we felt like we are entitled to because our parents had it. So let's look at what scripture says about this, about this pretending idea. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 7. It says, one man, one man pretends to be rich yet has nothing. This one says, some who are poor pretend to be rich, others who are rich pretend to be poor. There ends up being three groups in our society. Have you heard this before? There's the haves. They have stuff, right? They drive the nice car. They have the nice house. They have the, the boat, the RV, the jacuzzi in the backyard. They invite you over for picnics and barbecues and all of that, knowing you don't have those things, and they invite you over so that you can go, ooh, and ah at all of the beautiful things that they have. Knowing full well you live in a one-bedroom flat downtown. So you have the haves, you have the have-nots. They don't have anything. They don't have any stuff. 
They're, they're barely making it. They're, they're just getting by. But then there's a third group. We have the have not paid for the stuff that they got, and they're in debt and bondage. So they're not haves. They, they are haves, but they do not really because all that stuff is owned by the bank. Now, if you swipe a credit card, maybe you do or don't know this. If you swipe a credit card, what are you doing? You're taking a loan, a prearranged loan from the bank at a prearranged interest rate that you're going to pay for a prearranged very, very long time. Because most credit cards, now, I don't know if you know this or not. Sister Letitia and I both worked in a credit card company at Chase Bank. When you ever call the credit card company and you're like, hi, can I check my balance? Can you tell me what my interest rate is? Things like that. That was Sister Letitia. You got her first level. But then you get mad at them because you don't like what they're saying. You're like, I want to talk to your supervisor. You got me. I was one of those. And it wasn't that we were a supervisor. We were just another group of call center people who had more power, more, more access to the system to make you happy. Well, Mrs. Johnson, I sure understand why you would be upset at an interest rate of 29.99% APR. However, you were late on your last four payments, and we're still waiting on the last payment, and it didn't clear. That's why your rate is so high. That was us. Do you know that most people's credit card rates are somewhere north of 14, 15% interest on a credit card? That's horrific if you actually do the math out. So how do we, as a people, act our wage? Remember we talked last time that most of us are spending beyond what we have come in. Most of us have more expenses going out than we have coming in. Well, there's two things I think we need to look at. Number one, I think we need to look at the biblical values of this. The first thing is we need to embrace the value of self-control. If you're a note taker, you can drop that down. Where do we find this? This is Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 28. And it says, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. Think about that for a second. Think about the little kid. I want it now. Any of your kids ever do that? They're in the store and they see something they really want and they start kind of throwing a fit and you're like, if you don't knock it off, right? I'm going to give you something to cry about. I know none of you have ever said that. It's just us, but <laughs> thank you for making me feel better. It's just a toy, right? But it's important to them. Do you know that we have that little kid inside of us? Even as adults, it's still there. I want it now. I want to have it today. I don't want to wait till tomorrow. I don't want to wait five years. Women, I'm not picking on you. I'll pick on the men in a second. You nickel and dime us. You nickel and dime us to death. Uh, you get a new hairdo to match the new purse that matches the new shoes that matches the belt that you got three weeks ago. And while, yeah, all of those in particular aren't very much, they add up, right? And so you might have two, three, four hundred dollars. Now, listen, ladies, I love y'all, but I see some of the purses you carry. I'm not a fashionista guy, but I'm aware of certain brand names like Coach and Louie and some of those. And I see some of the purses, and I know what those cost. Do you know why I know what those cost? Because my wife wants one, too. And we go to the outlet store, and I wait for the coupon, and I wait till a, a, a Christmas or a birthday or something like that to try to figure out if I can figure out how to pay for that. But then you got to get the matching belt and the matching nails, right? The acrylics and, and the extensions and all of those things that make your hands look very beautiful. Men, how many of you care a bit about what her nails look like? Yeah, see, look, ladies, look around. There's no hands. We don't care. They could be the gnarliest, nastiest looking, well, maybe not that, but you know what I mean, okay? But men don't think that you're off the hook. Men, you don't nickel and dime the, the family budget. 
You go for the gusto. You do it all at once. Okay, one big swath, one big purchase. What is it? What did you? I bought a timeshare. We, us, and all the neighbors, we're going to Vegas. We're going to Florida, and we're going to have all this great stuff. Oh, and by the way, since we're going to be in Florida, I bought a new boat. Well, our little car can't pull the boat, so I bought a truck, too. Well, now you got a truck payment, a boat payment, and the timeshare payment. And guess what? <laughs> You're strapped. So we're not off the hook. All of us need to learn to say no. Say no with me. No. Do you need, absolutely, ladies, do you need the new set of nails? No. That was a little weak. Men, do we really need to play golf twice a week? No, especially since I don't like golf. How about soccer? Would that one touch a little bit bigger nerve? All of us, do we need the $4 Starbucks coffee, grande latte, half-calf, double mocha, light, foam, extra whip every other day? No. no. Uh-oh. That one was, we, sister over here got it, but the rest of us, do we really need that drink? No, we don't. Okay? There's a coffee thingy right over there. You can make a cup for free. Let's step on toes a little bit. Shall we? Does your 12-year-old need an iPhone? No. <laughs> Thank you, sister. No, they don't. Did we make that mistake? Yes, we did. We'll admit it. Do we really need all of the new whatever it is? No, we don't. You get the point. Now listen, is a new truck, a boat, a jacuzzi, a time... Well... I'm not for timeshares. If you want to know more about that, you can talk to me privately. But do we real, are those things bad in and of themselves? No. If you're out of debt entirely, you don't owe anybody anything, and you're like, hey, you know what? I've saved. I've done the plan. I have the money. I'm going to go lay down $15,000. It might not be a brand new truck, but it might be just a couple of years old, and I've got a good vehicle now. Yeah, go for it. If you're completely out of debt, there's no reason not to do those things. Ladies, if you're out of debt entirely and you've got the money, go get your nails done. Get your hairdo that goes to Jesus. We used to call that, back in the day, they called it, uh, church ladies called it the Tower of Babel. Uh, I think the real name of it was called the Beehive, uh, but church ladies always called it the Tower of Babel hairdo. But when you're out of debt... It's okay, you can do those things. So here's the thing I want us to learn. We need to learn to say no for a little, thank you in the back, for a little while so that we can say yes for the rest of our life. We need to learn to say no for a little while so that we can say yes for the rest of our life. Dave Ramsey has a phrase that he's very popular for hearing or for saying, and it's this. It says, if you, will, if you live like no one else, later you can live like no one else. In other words, if you'll live like nobody else today, in other words, save your money, say no, Defer, defer gratification today. Save your money. Then later, you're going to be able to live like nobody else because they're all going to be strapped, broke, in debt, bound by all of this stuff, and you're going to be free to go do whatever it is you want to go do, to live the life that you want to live. The second thing in acting our wage is to embrace the value of, and this is a hard word, sacrifice. We don't like that word in our society. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. So what is the definition of sacrifice? It's giving up something we 
Anybody want to guess? We love. For something we love even more. Sacrifice. Giving up something we love for something we love even more. I may love tennis, but if tennis gets in the way of my relationship with Jesus, I need to give it up because I love Jesus even more. I love my children. I love technology. I may need to give up buying new toys because my children need new shoes. My children need dental work, whatever it may be. I love technology, but I love my children even more. Giving up cable te television so that you can have a debt-free Christmas. You think about how much do you pay a month for cable TV? How much do all of your streaming services, Hulu, Netflix, Disney+, Plus, uh, NBC, Paramount+, Plus, how much do all of those add up to in a month versus grabbing a book, going outside? I know those aren't as fun, but think about how much you'd have to save and how much you'd have to be able to put toward Christmas, birthdays, whatever, anniversary. Ladies, can I get an amen, right? Vacations, trips. Staying in the small house so that one of you can stay home with the kids rather than buying the next big, beautiful home. College students. Loving to go to school and being out on your own, but maybe taking on a roommate or two so that you can graduate debt-free. You're not having to take on the rent of the, the dorm room or the house that you live in, and then also having to pay for school and pay for books and meal plans and all of those things, and you're able to take the money from those, those other roommates and apply that to your debt. We talked last week about brown bagging it, so giving up eating out. Remember the number from last week about how much you can save over a lifetime if we simply take our lunch versus eating out. Does anybody remember that number? It's $112,000 over a lifetime. $112,000. Assuming you eat out at a like regular restaurant each, each day. The problem with our society today is we're, we're asking the wrong questions. What's the question we're asking right now with our instant gratification society? How much down, how much a month? We want something, how much do I have to put it, give you today, and how much are the payments each month? We're financing everything. But how much is the real cost by the time you add in fees, interest, and all of the other stuff that goes along with it? How did it go from that? Last week, we looked at those that are carrying a balance on their credit card. Average is $14,517 in unsecured credit card debt. What do I mean by unsecured? There's secured debt and there's unsecured debt. Secured debt is your home, your car. In other words, if you mess up and you don't make the payments, the bank can come and say, we want this back. And we're going to sell it and try to get as much as we can out of it. Unsecured debt is you saying, by my name, my signature, I'm going to carry on this debt. If you don't make your payments, the bank has nothing to go get. They can't put you in debtor's prison anymore because we don't have that anymore. So people are signing literally their life away at some points. How did we get to $14,000? It's easy. Think about the trip to Disney. Think about the home theater surround sound HD for your one bedroom apartment, right? I, I, this, this is the true story. I had a, a roommate who did that. He went out, we rented an apartment and he went out and bought the nicest sound system TV thing for our apartment. It was great, I loved it, but he, I don't even, he spent like, 
I think $3,000 or something like that. We lived in a junky neighborhood apartment on the second floor. $10,000 worth of equipment in an apartment that was 500 bucks a month. It made no sense. And we do. We, we nickel and dime it all down. So let's break this down for a second. We're going to get practical for a second. If you pay $217.93 a month on, what did we say, $14,517, right? That's what the average person carrying a balance has. At what, Remember what I said, north of 14% interest, so we're going to cut it in the middle at 18%. It will take you, anybody want to guess how long it'll take you to pay off that $14,000? Students, college students, this is important. This is where you're at right now. Student loans, credit, college students, there is not a week, and I actually had it confirmed and he didn't know I was preaching on this today. There's not a week, I'll almost guarantee you, you don't get a credit card offer in the mail or in your face on campus. Here, take this card. It's a student card. It's got a great rate. It's going to be 0% huh, for a time. How long is that going to take to pay off that $14,500? It's going to take 40 years to pay off that debt. Do you want to know how much you have paid at the end? at 18% interest on that $14,000 over the 40 years? $104,606.40. So students, tell me, is $14,000 worth of debt at 18% worth it? What's that word we said earlier? No. I'm not hearing a lot of no's. I'm afraid that means a lot of us has got credit card debt. And we're going, a lot of us took a big, <laughs> ouch. But, let's, let, let's maybe do some encouragement. If instead of accumulating $14,000 worth of, of credit card debt, if you were to invest that same $14,517 at 12%, now that is a generous investment rate, if you know anything about investing, that is assuming a long-term investment. Remember, we we're talking about 40 years. So at 40 years, if you were to invest that same 14,517, just that amount, no more added to it, at 12%, instead of being $104,000 in debt, at the end of 40 years, do you know what you would have? $1,350,820. This is the power of compounding interest. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're just not a, a money person, come talk to me. I would love, I would be more than happy to sit down with you and help you work out your books. Okay, one more. That same investment, 14,517, and if you, okay, you were willing to take that in debt, right? So you're going to have to pay the two seventeen ninety three. So if you were to take that same fourteen five seventy seventeen, add the payments that you made that two seventeen ninety three that you were willing to pay in debt payments, and add it over the forty years, you would have three million five ninety seven six fifteen seventy five. How many could retire after 40 years with $3 million and be okay? All right, just Brother Gabriel, okay. Pastor Jonathan. All right, everybody else, you need more than $3 million. I need to know what you're doing because I want to come work for you. <laughs> Giving up something you love for something that you love even more. Look at the difference that it makes. I want... I want it now, $104,000. But if I wait, well, we'll, even, we'll be short. Having a million three in the bank, being able to retire and do all those things we talked about last week, giving more trips, vacations, loving on family, all of those things. So what is the, the, the phrase that we talked about with Dave? The quote, 
If you'll live like no one else, later you can live like no one else. Don't take on all of the debt. Don't take on all of the being bound and strapped and all of that. The other part of this idea of how do we act our wages, we need to embrace the value of planning. If you look at Luke chapter 14 and verse 28, it says, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? It's good wisdom, yes? How about an amen? Amen. There we go. Are you all awake? I know. We're talking numbers. We're doing math. Even me, not my strong suit, but it's important that we as a church have a godly perspective of money, like we talked about last week, that we're acting our wage. Go on to Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 5. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Again, another really good Dave Ramsey quote. You can wander into debt. In other words, oh, I, I got that card. I'm not going to use it. And then you end up using it. Well, I, I just, I'm just going to use, it's, it's just this. And then I'm going to put it away. You can wander into debt, but you won't wander out of it. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take effort. It's going to take planning to get you out of debt. So, that's all been prefaced. Those were my points. Yes, we're just about done. But how do we get started getting out of debt? How do we get started acting our wage? First thing is we've got to create a budget. How many of you budget? And, and be honest, you actually have a real budget. Okay? The rest of us, it's okay. Listen, your pastor was there not a whole long time ago. It's been a number of years now. But we just, what came in, we spent. As long as we didn't overdraw the bank account, we were okay. You need to create a budget. I can tell you, we've been there. We made the stupid choices. We got involved in the credit card thing. We racked up credit card debt back in the day. <clears throat> we are still working on paying certain things off. It's been there. We're, we're, we're fixing it. But I can tell you, from now probably 10 years, 15 years, 12 years, 12 years, of doing Dave's plan and working our budget. The budget has been the single biggest tool to changing how we manage our money and how we make our money work for us. We don't work for our money. You have to create a budget. You say, but pastor, I'm not good with that kind of thing. Well, guess what? Do you think I would leave? I would tell you you need to do something and not give you the tool to do it. So here's what I want you to do. I'd like for everybody to do this, but of course I'm not going to force you. I'd like you to pull out your phone and turn your camera on and scan this QR code. This QR code, I promise it's not a virus, it's not a bug, it's not anything bad. This is a tool by Dave Ramsey called Every Dollar. It's a budgeting tool. It, it exists on your phone. Again, if you think pastor is... Just telling you one thing and not living it out. Second app is mine. We use it every day. This is how we budget and plan. If you can't find it, if the QR code doesn't work, it's just if you look in your app store for every dollar, E-V-E-R-Y-D-O-L-L-A-R, -E every dollar, Dave Ramsey, it's a green one with some bills, dollar bills on the, on the cover, uh, kind of fanned out. Download that. And it'll walk you through the process of creating a first budget. This is the foundation to what Dave Ramsey has set up as a thing called Financial Peace University. And this is the start of what he calls the baby steps. So to create a budget, so Dave has what is called baby steps. 
that we're going to talk about here in just a couple of minutes. But to create a budget, you list all of your income, whatever you're going to bring in, everything that you know about. If you know you're going to get $50 from grandma because it's your birthday month, you put it down in your income. If you know you have a job and you're working X number of hours, you put that in. If you don't know how many hours you're going to get, you estimate it. You put that in as your income. Second, you take out of your budget your 10% of your tithes. Now, this is from your gross income. So before we do anything at all, we track all of our income. We take that number, so let's say we're going to do easy for math, $1,000. Most of us don't live on $1,000 a month, but it's easy enough. You have $1,000 worth of income, you take your 10%, that's $100. You set that aside for your tithes and offerings, that goes to the church. After that, you list all of your expenses, even the ones that you wish weren't there. Okay, so your Hulu subscription, your nail appointment, your haircut, your boat payment, your golf game that's going to come up every two weeks. All of your expenses get listed, and in every dollar it has all predefined categories for you, or you can make your own. We now are to a point where we've kind of created our own so that we can track it the way that best suits and helps us. It's flexible enough to do that. Now, before you think, Pastor, you're pushing this app awful hard, I get nothing out of it, okay? This is not an advertisement for Dave Ramsey. This is your pastor did it, and I'm one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. It's a tool that we use, and I want to pass it on to you. So you list all of your expenses, and you need to budget down every dollar, hence the name of the app. You budget, it's called a zero dollar budget. You don't leave anything unbudgeted. What are we doing? We're making our money work for us so that we don't work for our money. My money knows at the beginning of the month, it has a place on, on the 21st of that month, so many dollars are going to this bill. So many dollars are going to my tithe once a week. Again, haircuts, dog food, snacks, the party at work, and you've got to bring something. Subscriptions, streaming services, Apple Care, whatever it may be. And again, all of this is part of what Dave calls his baby steps. You create your budget. Once your budget is set, now we're going to start in to working to get out of debt and to have financial peace. The first step that he has is, well, let me just tell you what all of them are. The first step is to save $1,000. This is a starter emergency fund because all of us have something that comes up. Number two is to pay off all your debt. Number three is to save three to four months worth of ex expenses, which make up a fully funded emergency fund. Number four is you invest 15% into your retirement. Number five, you save for college for the kids. By the time they're ready to go, you've already got a good nest egg put aside. Number six, you pay off the house. So back at number two, you pay off all your debt except for the house. You don't pay off the house yet. Number six, you pay off the house. Number seven, you build wealth and give. You never finish number seven. It just, it's, it's where you land. So that first one is built is of the first step. We're not going to dig into the rest. We're only going to hit these first two, uh, and then we'll, we'll be done. But the first one is to save $1,000 for a starter emergency. Things are going to break. Somebody's going to hit a ball through your window. Appliance is going to wear out. Car is going to have problems. Kids are going to stick a crayon up their nose and you're going to have to go to the emergency room to have the doctor pull that crayon out of their nose. Okay, it happens. We've all been there. We've all had things, crazy things happen. So how do we get, you go, Pastor, I ain't no way I'm getting $1,000 put away. It's possible we did it. We've had an emergency come up and we had to do it again. And we had to go back and start over. It happens. You can sell stuff. 
You can get a second job if you need, a part-time, just a, an evening, a couple of times a week. You can eat ramen. Dave, I don't like this about Dave, but Dave is a big proponent of rice and beans. That's all you eat until you get your $1,000 emergency fund. You spend nothing else on groceries. You clip coupons. Step number two is you pay off all your debt except the house using what is called the debt snowball. Paying off all of your debt can be daunting. If you're paying off debt, your minimum payments are at 120 months. So we're just using a hypothetical number. If you have all, a bunch of debt and it's going to take you, if you were to do out the, the math, it would take you 120 months to pay off the debt. If you were to use the debt snowball to pay off those same debts, you could do it in 21 months. That's a difference of 99 months of payments. That's over, what, uh, seven years, eight years difference? So if you were able to, an additional $1,110 invested, that's the difference. Again, we're using a hypothetical number. Take that, that debt that you would have saved using the debt snowball would equal up to $1,110 and invest that at 8% for the 99 months that you would have been paying on it, you would end up with $153,992. Again, compounding interest can be your friend. This is something, again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I want to encourage you. But this is what Proverbs says, 6, 5 says, Save yourself like a gazelle escaping from a hunter, like a bird fleeing from a net. Get out of debt like a gazelle. Dave's phrase is, get out with gazelle intensity. Don't care what other people think. Have your goals, set your vision. Because a godly man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So as we wrap up, we don't serve money, we serve God. Money serves us as we serve God. So how do you get started with your debt snowball? You list all of your debts. Small, large debts, largest to smallest. Sorry, smallest to largest. I wrote that wrong. Doesn't matter what the interest rate is, don't get caught up in that. Whatever your smallest payment is, or smallest um, total, not payment, your smallest total debt is, you list that first, and you go accordingly. If you do go to the Every Dollar app, put all your debts in, it will organize them for you into the debt snowball. It will automatically do that for you. You pay the minimum payment on all of your credits, credit, all your debts, except for that smallest one. You pay that one. Once you pay that one off, you take that payment, because you've already been spending the money, right? You, you, you've already got all these debts. So you take, let's see if I can get this here. There we go. Oh, come on, there it is. Okay, so you take lows at 18%. The payment, or the total owed is $450. The minimum payment is $50. So you take that. Once you've made that, paid that off, you go down to Target, which is your next one, at, there we go, at $650. It, its minimum payment is, what, 30 I think. Okay, but you're not just paying 30 to Target now. You're paying that 50 plus the 30, so now you're paying $80 to Target every month. You were already paying it to Lowe's, so why not, with gazelle intensity, get things paid off? And you'd keep doing that and adding to, to where by the time you're all said and done, your school bill that has, sorry, I can't read from that angle, $9,000 in, in debt, $200 a month payment, you take that plus all these other payments, and there's your 1110. Then once you're done, you've paid that off. After 21 months, you've paid all that off. Now you can take that 1110 that you've been paying to debt, you can begin to pay yourself, and you're going to start having money that you didn't realize that you actually have access to. So again, 
I know I went over it fast. I know there was a lot of detail there to have to go over. If you would like, I want to remind you of two things. Number one, I love you, and I will do anything I can to help you. Number two, I'm your pastor. Things you share with me don't get shared with anybody else, ever. If you would like to sit down, break open your finances, I won't share that. I won't tell anybody. And you're just like, Pastor, would you help us set this in, in motion? Because we want to get this done. I am more than happy to do that. There's, listen, I've helped people do this system who were literally broke. They had almost no money. But we helped them find the little bits that they did. We put them on a budget. We helped them find opportunity. And all of a sudden, they weren't broke anymore. They were spending a whole lot of money on things that weren't necessary. So if I can be of help to you, go into the church app. Down at the bottom on that first page, meet with pastor. Schedule an appointment, a meeting. I would love to sit down and help you with it. Because my goal is to help you be everything God planned and wants you to be. And that includes even being financially healthy. So that is my encouragement to you. Last bit, and then we're going to close. How do you handle your finances in total? Pray before you pay. Pray about it. If it's under $100, so think about a new shirt, a new pair of shoes. If you're paying more than 100 bucks for shoes, you need to be prayed for. <laughs> I'm kidding. I know there's some in here that love shoes. My son is one of them. Brandon loves shoes. But if under $100, you should pray for a day. Pray about it. Sleep on it. Do I really need the new pair of shoes? Do I really need a new shirt today? Second, if it's between $100 and $1,000, pray for a week. Seriously. Take the time to think about it. Because you're, you're talking about dropping... $700 on something? You can spend seven days asking the Lord if this really is what you need for your life. If it's over $1,000, take 30 days to pray for it. Pray about it. You know, if you're, we're talking about, you know, if it, it, a new car, um, wash, the washing machine and dryer, you know, if they break, you, you know, that goes back under the emergency fund thing. That's different. But if it's over vacation, Disney, whatever it may be, pray for it. Lord, is this what you have for us this year? Or could that money be used? Do you have a mission strip that we need to expose our children to? Disney's great, but they went there last year. But you know where they haven't been? They haven't seen rural America in a church that barely can survive and see mom and dad labor to see a, a, a church do well again. Or whatever it may be. What opportunities could God do with $1,000 that you're going to spend? And so pray about it. Pray before you pay. That being said, I want to pray for you. I want to close uh, in, in a, just a, a brief word of prayer. And then we'll get you out of here oddly right on time. So... Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, for all that you've done in and through us. God, your Holy Spirit gives us direction and wisdom. Your Holy Spirit acts as a paraclete, acts as the, the comforter. Father, we pray that as, as we look at, at our finances and, and sometimes even take a hard look that is maybe a little embarrassing or a little painful, Father, we pray that you would help us to, to get this, this house in order. And that we would do well, Father, to honor you by getting rid of the, the bondage that's been keeping us captive. Father, some of us have been under so much financial bondage that we have no clue what joy really is even anymore. So, Father, I pray right now for the person who feels bound. Lord, I pray for freedom in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for a release of the Holy Spirit in their life, for vision, for their finances. That there is hope. There is a way out. And if they need the help, Father, that they would, they would reach out and, and seek the help 
from someone, me, a financial counselor, whatever it may be. Father, we're grateful that you give us resources to manage. And we are careful to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory for it. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, I want to say one other quick thing. This applies not only to your personal finances, but I know many of us own businesses. I'll tell you, I've used every dollar. It's a home budgeting app. I've used it to budget my side business. And when, when we were getting started, I, I used it to categorize kind of how we were going to spend and how we were going to plan and how we were going to manage. And it's been a game changer. So if you're, if you're a, a business owner, you know, create a separate account under a separate email. The program is free, by the way. There is a paid version. The paid version does give you a few extra things, and it also gives you the ability to connect your bank account to auto-download the transactions so you can categorize your transactions into your budget. You do not have to do that. If you're, if you're a person who likes to do manual entry, the app is completely free. You don't have to pay anything for it. Uh, that's one of the things I loved about it. We used the free one for a long time. So use it, create a separate account for your business, and just see, throw your business finances in there and see what happens. Uh, see if it's in balance. Uh, just a loving reminder, this is not me trying to get into your pocket. Don't forget your business should be tithing also. If your business is a profitable business, you should be tithing on that as well. I know numerous business owners Matter of fact, my former youth pastor at our last church had a very, very, very uh, well-established business. And God was faithful to him even through COVID because they tithed on, on their profit, on their income, uh, even back to the church. So again, I'm not, I hope you know me well enough to know that that was not a dig to get in your pocket, but a, an, advi an advice, an, a, a, a spiritual advice just to encourage you. You may disagree with me, and that's okay. I'm, I'm not going to fuss at you about it, but just some encouragement. That being said, I want to say again, thank you so much for being here. Um, hopefully, well, all, all of our Aguni friends will be back next week um, as they are at their conference. And so I pray that the Lord will go with you. He'll go, the Holy Spirit will go ahead of you, and that he'll go behind you. In the name of Jesus, amen. You are dismissed.